All right, welcome. Welcome to the Virtual Training Institute, day one, the final session of Monday. Um, we are going to get started here in just a few minutes with adult learning theory and professional learning with Carolina from Strong City, Baltimore. First, I'd like to get started and share a poll. We would like to know where you are, what you are, what role you're doing in your program. So I'm gonna launch the poll. If you will just take a moment to share what your role is within your program. All right, it looks like we've got three people with us, Carolina. And let me go ahead and share those. Oh, very evenly split between instructional specialists, ABE instructors, and ESL instructors. So we have a wide variety of people joining us today. That's great. All right, so with that, um, everyone is muted upon entry. I'd like to remind you if you'd like to um, ask a question or share something with Carolina, you can go ahead and use the questions um, panel on your control panel. So with Without further ado, I'm going to turn us over to Carolina. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me this uh, Monday afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for making time. Um, and today we are going to discuss adult learning theory um, and focus on learners' persistence, uh, self-regulation, and goal setting. So a little bit about me before we move on to this wonderful quotation by Benjamin Franklin. My name is Carolina Belen, and I'm the instructional specialist for the ELA side of the program with Strong City Baltimore Adult Learning Center. And uh, before I became an instructional specialist, I was an instructor for um, ESL in multiple colleges in, um, in suburban areas, rural areas, now in the more urban areas. So I think my adult learning experience has been collected from just multiple sources and, and multiple places of employment. Um, and I found this wonderful quote, um, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. And I think that sums up um, adult learning very well because um, as an adult, you really need to be involved in your learning um, to reach your results. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, just the principles of andragogy and, and its theory and uh, share and learn some new strategies for uh, learner self-regulation and persistence and discuss it. We're going to apply it to profiles that I've created um, that are both on the ABE and ELA side of the programs. So before we just dive into it, I'd like you guys to go to uh, menti.com and uh, use this code 763913 and answer this question, how do you learn best? Because we're all adults in this, uh, in this webinar, I'm hoping. Um, so as adults, how do you learn best? Do you learn best by experiencing things uh, visually, um, maybe by listening? Um, anything that helps you learn in a best way, if you could please put that over there. And let's take a look. I see here, productive, doing, reading, I'm learning fast. I'm jealous. <laughs> productive, yes, again, writing, doing, kinesthetically. Clear overview. Oh wow, details. Kinesthetically again, I think. Exploring. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of um, hands-on learners, visually, reading, creating, note-taking, tech, thinking out of the box, Hopeful, learning hopefully, yeah. <laughs> in person, mm -hmm. watching, conversation. I see the biggest one is still doing and a lot of synonyms to the word doing. Great. Clear overview, modeling, discussing, 
recommending, I see here, more and more responses. I see visual, doing, and reading are still leading here. There's still more responses. Writing. Watching, in person again, involving. Great, thank you so much. Pondering, so again, modeling, mm -hmm. imitation. So as we see here, we have a lot of kinesthetic learners. So everybody, I mean, not everybody, but majority of us learning by doing and imitating and modeling. And um, I am also in this category, actually. Um, I am a kinesthetic learner myself. Um, but as you guys can see, this is something, this is the, the workshop that I do in person. And when I do it in person, I bring a yarn, you see it in that picture here. And I toss this yarn holding the thread. And then everybody says what they, the way that they're learning the best. And what we did online here, uh, we also did kind of create like a web, like a net of, um, how we're learning and i think that is going to be very useful to understanding the next picture the the difference between uh, pedagogy and andragogy um, these two terms um, we hear them as educators we hear them all the time and sometimes we even hear pedagogy when people are talking about adult learning and um and i've heard that many times but truly the differences between pedagogy and andragogies are vast so now this is my question. Um, oh, before I show that, what do you guys think is the best way to phrase that? What is the biggest difference between pedagogy and adult learning, andragogy? Please put it in questions. Oh. Somebody says, I cannot hear you. I'm not sure. Carolina, I'm trying to troubleshoot Jean, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Um, okay, I see a chat message. All right. And I have a raised hand. Oh. But I'm not sure if I'm seeing any questions here. But Ellen, can you? Patty is saying children can learn incrementally. Adult learning mm -hmm. is more sporadic. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a great observation. Yes. Any other observations about adult learning in comparison to children learning? All right, I hope the next picture is going to make it a little bit clearer for us. Um, uh, we also have adults mm -hmm. need to understand the why. Exactly, oh, I love that. Yes, that is very, very accurate. So let's take a look at these two um, representations of what does it mean. Um, well, now we're rolling in. Um, okay. We also have many adult learners are more self-directed and motivated from Jeannie Moon. And All true. We have Deborah Stevens is sharing real life applications for adult learning. Yeah, I see you guys have a very some very good observations. I completely agree with all of that. Now we can take a look here, and this also kind of includes what you all mentioned. Pedagogy, we have this figure of a teacher or of an instructor being the authority figure almost, right? He or she is giving that knowledge to the rest of the students. It's kind of like, you know, going from top to bottom. Uh, they are there to learn. They are the less experienced, the less educated. So they are getting that knowledge from a person that has more experience, has more education. They are you know, specialized in the subject and they are sharing that knowledge. In andragogy, on the other hand, we have, it is like a web. It is like that yarn tossing activity. It is like that uh, word map activity. We have adults sharing their knowledge, sharing their experiences and teacher and instructor being more of a facilitator than an authority figure that tells them what to do and how to do it. I'm not saying that pedagogy cannot be more of a, um, 
or the sharing experience as well. But usually we see that tendency that uh, andragogy is more teacher and instructor as a, on an equal level and um, facilitating that process of sharing knowledge, knowledge between adults. Also, we have the age gap. Right in pedagogy, we have a teacher usually, usually, always being older, sometimes significantly uh, than the students. And in andragogy, sometimes the teacher is significantly younger than his students. And making sure that you are putting yourself on that equal position as a facilitator, it encourages them because sometimes they they are doubting their uh, their self worth and the esteem and knowing that they are older than the teacher and, and just being in the middle of that circle instead of the top of a triangle helps them feel more comfortable sharing their knowledge. Um, let's take a look at the principles of adult learning. Um, and we are going to and make sure that you uh, put your questions or comments um, when you want to share something because um, this is for you guys also to, to share your observations. But with the principles of adult learning, um, it's really important to promote self-direction. That means we are giving the students um, the tools to build their house, basically, instead of just giving them the house. Uh, we're not enabling them. We're giving them the skills to be able to reach whatever they want. Um, again, we're valuing their experience. This is talking again about that web of exchanging experiences. Um, they have skills and things that uh, maybe are not theoretical, but they are practical, and it's important to acknowledge that. And it's important to revolve around their goals. If they don't have the goals, you can try and give them some directions, but most of them do have a more vague or a more specific goal that you could revolve around as an instructor. And another thing is, again, make it practical. Uh, in pedagogy, uh, the children, they are given a lot of time, 12 years, and um, to absorb as much knowledge as they can from different fields, from different, they're learning physics, they're learning literature, they're learning geography. Here, we don't have that time with adults. They have a specific time frame that they want to achieve something. So it's important to make it practical to what they want to achieve. Um, next one is respect and collaboration. Um, again, exchanging experiences and creating the respect that you as an instructor, you're there to help them out and um, to give them the resources and skills to make the collaboration just more effective for everybody. And the last one is also corresponding to making it practical, revolving around goals, prioritizing relevance. So seeing where the skills are lacking, maybe when we're trying to achieve some goals, there will be some skills that are more fluent, there will be the ones that are not as much. Let's make it relevant to those skills that need an upgrade, basically. Now let's take a look at self-regulation. What is self-regulation? This pretty explains it pretty well, I think. Our ability to self-regulate, it really, really influences our outcomes. And a lot of students do not have that ability to self-regulate. Um, I actually uh, participated in a workshop about students that have been traumatized, so students that experience trauma and we know that in many of our adult populations, we have had students in both sides of our program, ESL and ABE, that have experienced trauma before. And for those students, self-regulation is even lower. So it is even more important for us to try and implement those strategies for the students to be able to self-regulate. Let's watch this short video. Um, you can show it to your students later on. I will definitely share a link, um, but it basically shows you pretty well what self-regulation is.
Carolina, we can't hear the sound, so maybe you can kind of just talk about what the video, we can see it, but maybe you can talk through what's going on. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys cannot hear the sound? No. Oh no, that's not great. Well, it is a Cookie Monster and we can play it, keep playing, but I can tell you guys. Uh, basically, we are talking here about basic strategies to uh, self-regulate. So self-talk, positive talk, practicing patience and uh when you want to get that cookie for example like the cookie monster it is important to think about the repercussions and your long-term goals this is what we are trying to achieve here i'm sorry you could not hear i'm definitely going to link it to you later so what is self-regulation you can manage your emotions your thoughts and you can do so in order to navigate your life successfully. And when you implement that in your learning, you can understand and control your learning environment. So when you're able to, for example, you know, you have to study, um, but you also want to go out with your friends. Um, you do a little self check and you think about your long term goals and then you realize you have to stay and learn. This is self regulation. And this is something that a lot of students lack, unfortunately, and this is something that needs to be implemented by their awareness. Um, and then we get on this cycle of self-regulation and, and the learning of self-regulation. So you can start in any of those um, points, but we can start with planning and setting goals. Um, when you do so, you're able to analyze what you need to do and apply certain strategies and you can monitor your performance for self-reflection and adaptation and keep going to review your plans and goals, use different strategies, adapt again, and so on and so forth. So that way you can maintain your motivation and it is a constant cycle of self-improvement for the learners. How do we teach that self-regulation as instructor? First of all, we're teaching them cognitive strategies. And the first and most important one, I think, is the awareness of what self-regulation is and awareness of your thoughts and emotions and how they impact your later decisions. Um, building learners' metacognition, which we're going to talk about in a second. And that would lead you to maintaining and building your motivation. Um, so let's take a look at some of the cognitive strategies over here. Um, we have problem solving and critical thinking. Um, you can also always uh, focus on questions, problems, addressing them with your um, with your group of students through debate, discussion, and um, also just create depending how your students are learning best. And um, anything else that you guys think is important and relevant for cognitive strategies, please put in your questions. And I'd love for Ellen to summarize to me what your thoughts are on cognitive strategies. Next one, we have building metacognition. And um, it is all about three types of knowledge. It is the knowledge about yourself as a learner. So asking yourself questions such as, how do I learn best? Right Today we were practicing metacognition a little bit when we asked, how do I learn best? Visually, kinesthetically, um, what distracts me from learning usually? What makes it difficult for me? What kind of form of delivery I like the most? Those are all very important questions that you need to ask yourself in order to build that, that declarative knowledge. Then we have the next one is the one, the knowledge about strategies and procedures. So how do I apply my kinesthetic, like I'm a kinesthetic learner. So how, what strategies do I use to apply that? Do I create a chart? Do I create a graph? Do I make a presentation? Do I record myself? Am I visual? Do I write things down? Um, just knowing how to apply those strategies to your um, metacognition process. And then knowing when and why to use those strategies. Do I use them before a test? Do I use them to study daily? Um, it all matters in order to map your road to success as an adult learner. OK, 
Carolina, we do have a couple of comments. Vanessa sure. sharing the um, noting to be aware of cognitive overload. Mm -hmm. And Dora is mentioning that she really likes to point out skills when people use them in class. So like everyone sees the behavior and can label it for themselves in the moment. We usually take the time to walk through thinking of it as well. That's great. That's some great observations. I'd like to um, address the cognitive overload is when there is basically just too much. Um, it is a part of self-regulation and metacognition to choose relevance. And that is also something that students need to learn. It's an important, it's an important skill. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'm going to move on to our next one, is teaching motivation. I hope you guys all like the little meme uh, that I have here. Um, it is a lot about self-talk. It is a lot about building your a sense of self-efficacy. It is about building your self-esteem and the positive habits. And um, when we talk about self-talk, we, I've, I can tell you how many times I've heard students say things like, I don't speak English when they are in advanced class, or I will never do this, or, um, well, I just don't, I know my ABE teachers tell me a lot, I'm just not good at math because my mom's not good at math and my dad's not good at math, so I'm not good at math. Those are all becoming the negative habits of believing that you cannot do something. But through practicing positive self-talk, you can kind of overcome that. So um, I know previously I've heard Ellen um, said the comment about pointing out skills and appreciating the skills. What kind of things, and if you guys could put this in questions, what kind of things do you tell your students in order to change that negative outlook so many of them have on themselves? How do you increase their motivation by positive self-talk? So Vanessa is commenting that teachers sometimes don't think about modeling self-talk. That's true. We should think about that too, as teachers. And she mentions that modeling self-talk can be very powerful. And um, point to their accomplishments so far is a comment from Anna. That's very important. Yes, recognizing your own accomplishments, as little as they can be, um, is really the key to self-appreciation as a learner. And to anything, really. Even for us as instructors, it's important to acknowledge your accomplishments. Um, and when you acknowledge yourself, you will see other students doing the same thing. Okay. Now, another thing that is really important, and that could be a workshop on its own, is the goal setting. And I know all of you guys probably know about SMART goals, to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, it is a self-regulation technique to set the goals. It helps you keep and maintain the motivation. Um, so you cannot set your goal. You cannot set goals for the students. It's impossible. You can't enter their brain. Um, but you can help them set some of the goals for themselves. So it is a self-regulation technique, for sure. Now let's talk about learner's persistence. And here we have some drivers of persistence. And um, if you're interested in a handout and an article about learner's persistence, please do not hesitate to reach out. We're going to make it available for sure. And some of the drivers of persistence um, includes sense of community and belonging. And this is so relevant for both ESL and ABE. A lot of students are displaced. They don't feel like they belong. Um, as adult learners, they don't have that community. It's a smaller community than, for example, being in a middle school or high school or college. So it's so important to create that for them. Clarity of purpose. So here we are going back to goal setting. Uh, why am I here? Understanding why I'm here. Um, building agency, competence, relevance of what they're learning, and having the stability. So now I would like you guys to get into your questions as, again and tell me some specific examples of learner's persistence drivers. So
So for example, telling me for clarity of purpose, I encourage my students to do this and that. For relevance, I encourage them to do, et cetera. Um, can you please give me just some actual examples? How do you encourage persistence in your classroom? For example, I, I do a lot of field trips for building sense of community. Being in Baltimore, some of the students have never seen some of like the cool Baltimore things. So that helps me out with that. What do you guys do to build that? So Carolina, while we give them a couple of minutes to do that, sure. um, there are a couple of extra comments um, about your last question. Mm -hmm. um, Vaughn is sharing that when he approaches a math problem, he talks it out as he completes the problem. Kevin is sharing that um, that he tells them that they're all smart and intelligent and that they can get the answers with some thought. Now let's think through the problem. And Jesse is sharing that when students take um, the Aztec pretest and score 30%, they are usually so sad, but they say, they turn it around and say that that's great. You have a base of 30% of the material. Now let's build on that. So I love great. all those points. That's great. That is definitely, we're going back to uh, just building their motivation. That's great. Thank you guys so much. And so Jeannie is sharing that um, build learning routines so that learners feel comfortable to start a new task. That's great. That's the clarity of purpose, I'm guessing. And Vanessa says she always starts her lessons with objectives and relevancy. For example, when we are learning to determine fact from opinion, I address how that skill can help them in their daily lives. That's very, very useful. And I think we always encourage our instructors to state their objectives at the beginning of the class. That gives them a lot of uh, the sense of relevance. Anything else, guys? All right, Autumn is saying, to give students a sense of community, I introduce them to community resources and invite speakers from the community to class. And That's a great idea. To incorporate relevancy, I try to build real world connections into discussions and projects, for example, job resumes, cover letters, etc. Building life skills, that's great. Okay, if you guys have any more comments about learner's persistence, and we are going to continue with that topic, um, please put it in questions, but let's um, take a look at some profiles. So throughout, those are very abstract profiles that uh, I've created just based on my life experiences as an instructor and, and different student bases in different community colleges and organizations. And we are going to look at sort of real life, uh, real life students and look at what kind of barriers they can be faced, they, they are facing and what kind of self-regulation or persistence techniques we could implement as instructors to support them. So first of all, we're going to start with an ESL learner. His name is Alberto. Pictures are completely random. So this is not, a, this is not any of the students. Um, but Alberto is from Guatemala. He is 22 years old, uh, only for three years in the state so far. Um, and his last grade completed is 10. Uh, currently, he's a construction worker uh, who's single, doesn't have a family, and uh, his CASA score, if some of you are familiar with CASAs, um, is 197, which puts him at a level of a um, high beginner, low intermediate student um, in the ESL classes. Um, he definitely knows Latin alphabet. He can read proficiently in Spanish. Um, he has pronunciation problems with uh, reading certain English words. His schedule is very heavy, six days a week, 12 hours a day. Um, he is pretty good at math. Um, he discontinued his school so he could not develop them further. Um, but he likes technology, strong internet navigation skills, has a dream of opening his own business one day. And uh, his transportation is by car, 
as he works in different areas of DMV. Let's take a look at Alberto. And now I would like you guys to think about what could be his, his barriers to persistence and how would we address that? What specific things would you advise us as instructors to do to introduce self-regulation and persistence? So um, let's, let's take two minutes to think about it and um, post your suggestions in the question box. All right, looks like we have some comments coming in. Uh, Betsy is sharing, record himself reading a passage at the beginning of the class, the middle and the end to encourage persistence so that he can see how his pronunciation has improved. That's a great idea, Betsy. And Mary is sharing, utilize technology for his learning, perhaps include some things he can do at home since he's working so much and it may be difficult for him to take every class. Great, I think you addressed uh, both the, the potential problem and the solution, so that's great. And we have one more comment. Time constraints provide him some audio materials that he can listen to. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea too. Yeah, so definitely focusing on reading, um, on pronunciation and giving him some independent work um, might be a great idea, but also remembering that he does have a very limited schedule. So for students like that, and I'm sure many of us have experienced an Alberto or a similar <laughs> uh, profile, it's hard to keep them um, as motivated as at the beginning because the, they are tired. They are tired after their long day. And um, so it is up to us instructors to keep them interested um, and to keep them engaged and to give them things that they feel like they're relevant and they're going to amount to something for sure. Any other comments? Another comment from Jeannie. Um, he has mm -hmm. professional goals to discuss real life words um, that are used in different fields. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, Jesse is saying with similar students, they've had individual conferences, assigned online websites to practice pronunciation and reading skills, and then follow up on the plan. Mm -hmm. Christy is saying encourage using pronunciation apps for words. Vaughn is saying encourage time management skills. And Vanessa is sharing focus on his talents and strengths, give him choices of reading materials that are at his level and slightly higher, help him keep his goals at the forefront. Those are all incredible uh, suggestions, guys. I really like that, that you address specific ways on how an instructor could implement that for sure. And those are all pertaining to persistence. Um, yeah, one keeping him, Dora, mm -hmm. to use his sure. tech savviness to keep up with communication. Using his, exactly, and I've had that situation with one of my students who, very similar situation, very hard worker, a busy schedule, um, keeping in, in touch with him through WhatsApp was the way to go. So um, getting a little creative definitely, um, definitely helps. Oops, sorry. Um, all right, let's take a look at the next, um, next profile that we have, another ESL student. Soon. Uh, she is from China, uh, 35, uh, moved to the States two years ago, so not too, not too long ago, has a bachelor's degree in biotechnology um, that she got in China. 
Um, and uh, she does not work currently, is married with two children that are small children. <laughs> And her CASA scores is 227, so that puts her in a almost a test out. So she's an advanced learner, uh, but is very insecure about her speaking skills. Has a very strong Chinese accent, which makes her um, sometimes difficult to understand. Problems with the R and TH sounds, which is pretty common for um, Chinese speakers. Um, but her grammar is amazing. Um, she has very wide range of vocabulary. Um, would like to go back to work in her profession as a biotechnologist, but um, she has never worked in the States. She's a little anxious about the relevance of her skills. And uh, her husband takes care of the children. When she goes to class, she has strong computer skills and she walks to classes. So um, I want you guys to think right now again, what would be some potential problems and solutions and how would we address persistence and self-regulation in those solutions. And as we let people um, take a few oh. minutes to think and respond to that, we have a few additional ones for our last learner, which sure. are NASA use um, read aloud strategies that include modeling fluency and pronunciation. And from Selena, we have have him watch web series or YouTube videos in English. Great ideas. All right, now these are the current ones um, from Karen. Include her children if possible so that childcare is less of an issue. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea too. I mean, I'm not sure how a three-year-old would respond to that, but depending on the child, it's all possible. How would you guys um, address the fact that she does have a profession that's pretty universal? It's not a profession that relies on communicating as much and her anxiety. I really want to hear your input on that. Dora says maybe encourage job shadowing, maybe see what the work environment is like in the United States so that it's less scary for her. That's a great idea. I did not even think of that one. That's awesome. Yes, of course. For her to see what the job market looks like, job shadowing is great. And here we're crossing over to kind of workforce, workforce development. Um, that's a great idea. Um, Jeannie is saying that we can introduce different websites so she can practice pronunciation at her own pace and show how she can transfer her credentials also discuss career options she has. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Great says used her strong computer skills to research the biotechnology field in the US and possibly report on that in class. Great and idea. Then we, have, then we have a WIOA comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then Betsy is sharing that we can look into resources for her that target her specific pronunciation difficulties. Of course, that's great. Thank you guys so much. Those are so, so useful. How many of you guys, just for my ESL um, crowd here, um, if you guys could just um, tell quickly, um, have you encountered both, those, uh, both, both of those student profiles in your classroom? Um, many, many yeses and a couple of other comments. So, mm -hmm. um, Jesse is sharing with similar students in the medical and biomedical careers, many foreign students need to retake many classes and sit for the certification exam. Need to get the students' language still skills stronger to sit for those exams. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So giving her that clear goal 
of working towards a better language because of course if you want to be in a professional field you need to be completely fluent so that's a great comment yes uh, create a research project on childcare options in the community for future mm -hmm. employment and education and that also creates the sense of belonging because we have a student that is fairly new to the United States. She's only been there for, she's only been here for two years. So creating the sense of belonging by researching childcare options, um, introducing to play groups, that also helps out. That builds agency too. Any other comments on Zoom? Oh, or I mentioned uh, resources. I'm sorry and again. Some career transition resources. Great. And some programs have started bridge programs that combined ESL and intro to healthcare. That's great. Uh, these you guys have so many awesome ideas. Oh, just one final comment uh, that these types of classes are becoming very popular in grant funded ESL programs. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's because of the IELCE IET funding, which encourages programs to help get those language learners uh, into the job force more quickly. Exactly. Exactly. And, so many important things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from Christy, participate in possible clubs to gain more speaking experience. Talk to more people with with more people so that you can understand slang nuances and become comfortable speaking in non-professional activities. That's a very, very important comment that was made. Yes, I agree. Here, we're dealing with a student that has a lot of theoretical knowledge. Those people had years and years of formal education in English. So their grammar is very, very advanced. So is the reading and vocabulary. But there is a barrier. There is an insecurity about speaking. So we feel like the student is, their English level and fluency is much lower than it actually is. But once they unlock that speaking confidence, have more, um, have more opportunities to practice outside of the class, the progress is just incredible. So that is, that's a very relevant comment, to surround yourself with opportunities to speak. Great, thank you so much. I don't know, it was Christy, thank you. Um, all right, let's move to our ABE examples. We have Walter here, who's 56. Um, he earned high school diploma. He completed 12 grades, and works as a school maintenance worker, and is married uh, with two children over the age of 21. And um, for you guys familiar with TABE, his reading score is uh, L level 175. Um, knows the alphabet, but lacks uh, letter sound correspondence skills. Can write most letters of the alphabet, but not all. Um, he works a 40-hour uh, week, um, so five days a week, eight hours a day. And um, his, one of his goals is to open his own cleaning business. Um, in the past, he had some substance abuse issues that uh, might have affected his processing skills and has started adult education twice before, never completed a semester, and says that things get, oh, that other things always get in the way. So we do have that uh, persistence uh, struggle and commutes by car, works in the DC area and has never used a computer before. So um, potential um, barriers, potential ways to address that, um, waiting for your guys' comments. Uh, so it looks like the first comment for Walter is that he needs technology instruction ASAP. Mm -hmm. Basic computer skills would definitely be very useful. Yes. That's a great way to address his persistence. Uh, encourage him to tap into free resources to learn those computer skills. Mm -hmm. Great idea.
looks like all we have. Oh, here's another one. Um, if you have a smartphone, use it as a launch pad for learning basic computer skills before moving on to a full-fledged PC setup. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of you guys are addressing the issue of um, Walter having very low or non-existent computer skills. That is definitely the way to go, especially right now when uh, distance learning is just uh, becoming so, uh, you know, everywhere, basically. Um, but I think it's important also to address his self-confidence and his self-regulation, because we have here that and that's a problem with many students that they have the will, they have the motivation to start, but they don't have enough of it to keep going. So they drop out and then they enroll again and then they drop out again. So addressing that self-regulation problem, setting the goals, maybe in a more traditional ways, because there is, uh, there is an idea of, of, of a goal here, the opening your own cleaning business, maybe, um, trying to activate the motivation in that, um, addressing some of the underlying insecurities that he could have, that might be the way to go as well. If you guys wanna comment on that, feel free. A comment from Mary uh, suggests making the learning relevant, connected to his goal of opening a business. Great, yes. Um, Christy is mentioning that he needs encouragement to stay the course. The other things that get into his way may not be the real reason. Maybe he needs to have specific goals and a stepped plan to get there. Great. Um, comment from Dora, scheduling instruction and creating routines to foster persistence. Exactly. Creating routines and building those habits, uh, that's with metacognition. We discussed that before. Yes, the habit creation is all. And Karen is sharing research steps in owning a cleaning business and set up a step-by-step -step goal to achieve it. Great. All right. Thank you guys so much for your comments about Walter. We're going to move to our final student. And if you still have comments about uh, this one, uh, feel free to post them. Um, I'm sure Ellen will read it to me in the meantime. Um, let's take a look at the last student that we have here. Her name's Michelle um, from Jamaica, 23. Her last grade completed is uh, seven. Um, and she is unemployed, but she would like to get a job. She's a single parent with one child. The child has developmental difficulties and is five years old. Um, she either walks or takes a bus to class, um, speaks English and Jamaican Patois, and uh, reports that she cannot read well, um, that she can, I'm sorry, that she says that she can read well, but she can't remember or understand what she reads. So there's comprehension problem. Um, lives with her mother, would love to be independent and get her own apartment. Uh, interested in working in the medical field one day, so it's not very specific, but there is some kind of goal um, in her mind. Uh, likes her cell phone, um, knows how to use it, but computer skills are pretty limited, and um, has a pretty bad testing anxiety, low self-esteem, and fear of failure. So what strategies of persistence and self-regulation and um, would you guys encourage from Michelle? We see a couple of potential problems arising here. How would you, as an instructor, as an instructional specialist too, try and uh, address that? Um, we had give her a learning survey and a career interest survey. Great, surveys and are always great. Mm -hmm. Read early chapter books to her child and talk over the information with the child. That could help address her uh, reading comprehension. That's a great idea. Um, and Karen is clarifying that the learning survey would be the first um, step to gauge where she is as a learner and her mm -hmm. career interests. Sure, and I think sur surveys are a little bit more student friendly than tests, right? And that could um, help with the anxiety. Uh, Selena is saying we can introduce her to children's websites to use with her child. 
Mm -hmm. So more like family uh, literacy oriented approach. I like that as well. Yes. And Dora is saying to address the test anxiety or fear of failure, she would include example test questions with every session. Mm -hmm. Modeling the, yes, modeling the test on that. Great. Uh, suggestion to introduce apps that she can use on her phone. That I think is a great idea for most of the students right now. They all have a cell phone. Not all of them have a laptop or a PC. Um, that's a great strategy that's very universal. Thank you. And John is mentioning that it's possible that she has more than just testing anxiety. Perhaps this anxiety is affecting her retention as well. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, use practice tests as low stakes exposure to reduce anxiety of testing and fear of failure. That's great. Thank you so much. I, I like the um, uh, interest. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, practice, stop, think, write, and go back strategies for reading. Uh, teach fluency strategies to help her remember and understand what she reads. And I ask my students to think for one full minute before they write or speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that a lot. Think for one minute before you write or speak. Yes. That's a great self-regulation method because you get to organize your thoughts and emotions before you put them in action, basically. One more from Karen, it says, look at rental contracts or agreements to get familiar with that language. Mm -hmm. So building the vocabulary base as well. Do we have any more? Okay. Um, that looks like it for now. All right. Um, thank you guys so much for your participation. I am so glad that you found it interesting and you, you just participated, like your participation was so active and uh, you were able to, to follow through with, uh, with my questions and prompts. So uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, it was a great experience. If you need to email me, ask me anything, you can, this is my email address. Uh, you can see it below, Kate Balance, Strong City, Baltimore. Um, and the handouts will also be available with the recording. And um, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Carolina. Thank you so much for the information you've shared today. Um, and thank you all of you for participating in our last session on Monday. We have about nine sessions uh, scheduled for both Tuesday and Wednesday. So I certainly hope that you'll take uh, the opportunity to look at the schedule and find out other um, sessions that might be of interest to you. So I am going to post a feedback survey link in both the chat box and um, in the questions box because this is our second virtual training institute and we are always looking for feedback of how we can better serve your needs as instructors and program staff. So thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Um, Carolina, we are getting a ton of thank yous uh, to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Very relevant. So uh, it is very clear that that your audience has per, has incurred been encouraged by your content. So oh, that's you so means much. a lot. Thank you. Thank you all of you for attending. Um, just as a reminder, the um, handouts, the slides, the recordings, those will all be available after the institute on our website. Um, because we do encourage you to go back and maybe catch the ones that you weren't able to catch live. So thank you so much for your participation today, and I will see you in a future session. Thank you.